What is going on, guys and girls? Welcome to the channel. Hopefully, you guys are having an amazing day. In this video, we are going to cover top 15 most asked Scrum Master difficult interview questions that have been asked in a real interview at Accenture, and they have been given to me by my person who is in my mentorship group, who was kind enough to share these with me. And the person in my mentorship group, she's about to land her first Scrum Master job. Yes, her first Scrum Master job. And you can do the same. Click on the link down below. If you are looking for a Scrum Master job, by clicking on the link down below, not only will you sign up to learn the skills of becoming a Scrum Master, I will also help you with job placement and help you land your first Scrum Master job. If you follow the process and if you work hard, Click on the link down below. I'm the only person that can help you. Thank you so much. Now let's get started. The first question in this series is, give me an example of where, when you managed multiple teams. Okay, so yeah, uh, in this question, how you will answer this question is, as a Scrum Master, I have a lot of experience managing multiple teams. I was helping, I'm help, currently I'm helping uh, two teams in my current project and my teams are made up of uh, multiple developers, multiple testers uh, and business analysts, the product owner and me. And uh, we are together working on a multi-million dollar project. That is how you will answer this question. I mean, uh, it's a very simple uh, question. Um, now, the second question that I got from the Accenture interviewer towards my candidate was, Tell me about a time you failed. Now, this is a question that has been asked in many interviews before, and we have covered this question in much more depth in other interviews as well. But let's cover it right now. Tell me about a time you failed as a Scrum Master. And now I will add over here also as a Scrum Master. So tell me about a time you failed as a Scrum Master is the question that was asked by the interviewer to one of my candidates. Now, in this question, how you will answer this is that, yes, in my experience, when I failed, I feel that personally that I failed as a Scrum Master was during COVID. When there was a candidate, there was a person who was uh, joining the team new. Now during COVID, we were going through a lot of things. A lot of people were leaving the team. We were busy, we were slammed with a lot of work. And there was this one person uh, that was joining is a very young developer. And uh, to onboard him, we needed a lot of, he needed a lot of help because the senior developer needed to sit down with him, kind of do the knowledge transfer and help him out and help him learn the skills that he can use to become a great uh, you know, developer uh, in his role. But since we were so much slammed with work, the senior developer was not able to provide that time to the junior person. And me as a Scrum Master, I was so busy with my own stuff, I could not help the junior person out. And in that situation, what ended up happening was that uh, the junior person got frustrated eventually and ended up leaving the team, even though he asked me for help multiple times and I couldn't do it. And in that situation, I think uh, I failed as a scrum master. I could have helped him out more and helped him on, on board and maybe keep the person on the team. And uh, after the things got a little bit smoother and maybe you know help him on board and become a, a successful developer. Now. That is how you will answer this question. Or you can create your own scenario from your own examples. If you have a history of working in the industry, create your own scenario from your own examples, but definitely have an answer for this question. Never say, I never feel a scrum master. That is the worst answer that you can give for this question, okay? Never say that. Always be humble and always uh, create scenario-based answers. Now, moving on to the third part, which is walk me through how you do releases and when. Yeah, sure. So the thing with the releases is, guys, that releases are based on company com company and team by team basis. Now, my company, uh, we do releases every three. So you can say that in my company, we do releases every three months uh, because that is depending on the availability of the stakeholders. The stakeholders are present every three months. And uh, during the releases, what I do as a Scrum Master is basically I uh, create a release plan and I'm present during the release demo or during the sprint demo where we're showcasing the uh, stakeholders and the client what we have built so far and take their and collect their feedback and make sure their feedback is entered into the next iteration of the product that we are building and uh, collect their feedback and get an understanding of what we have done so far and what 
their uh, what their reviews are for what we have built so far. The releases happen after we have done everything, tested everything has been tested in the test environment, in the staging environment, and finally, once we get a go ahead from the stakeholders, we release it in the prod environment, and that is how releases are done. The frequency of the releases really depend on the availability of the stakeholders in some companies or in some contract. Stakeholders are available all the time. They're there. They're there to help you. They're there, you know, working alongside you. And they are there to guide you through the releases of what they want and what they do not want. But in some companies, the stakeholders might not be available. They might show up every two weeks. Then you might have to do releases every two weeks. And after every sprint, release an MVP, minimum viable product, or release every three months. It really depends on the availability of the stakeholders and only a person with real experience will give you this answer. And that's the answer that you need to give because this will show that you actually have real experience in the industry and no one else will tell you this answer. Okay, now, now the fourth question is, what role would you play specifically with the team that is currently under pressure? Uh, okay. What role would you play specifically with the team that is currently under pressure? So, uh, and guys, we're doing this session live. There is no like role playing or there is no like editing or anything like that. This is live, this is raw. We're just, you know, we got these answers and we are answering them for you. So let's, uh, you know, keep going with it. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe, guys. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Click on the link down below, set up a mentorship with me. I'm the only person that can help you get a Scrum Master job. That's it, let's keep going. What role would you play specifically with a team that is currently under pressure? Okay, so see, first of all, we need to figure out why are they under pressure? What's going on? What's the issue that they're under pressure? Did the uh, interviewer give it? And he should tell you that. You should ask the interviewer that. Why are they under pressure? What's going on? What's the issue here? Are they over committing and under, under delivery? Uh, that's why the stakeholders are pressing them. Hey. Why are you so? Why are you committing so much and then not being able to deliver? That means you guys are not working. Is that the thing that they're under pressure for? Is there a lack of resources? Is there a lack of skills? What's the issue that they're under pressure for? You have to figure that issue out, right? So the Scrum Master, you need to find out why is the team under pressure? What's the issue? Is it lack of resources, lack of skills? Or is it over committing and under delivering over and over and over? Is that the issue? What's the issue here? That's what you need to figure out. Now, once you've figured that out, what's the issue here? You get an understanding of that. You don't come up with any solution whatsoever. You facilitate conversations and let the team come up with their solution. You bring the problem to their face. Look, this is the problem. This is what we are facing. This is what we're what we are going through. We are under a lot of pressure because we are overcommitting. Okay, so we need to. So you sit down with the product owner, discuss with him, uh, with him or her the situation. Hey, we are under a lot of pressure because we are overcommitting. Why are we overcommitting? This is our velocity. This is what we are able to do. Let's just stick to that number, or maybe a little bit higher than that, but not like fifty points higher than that, or like sixty points higher than that. It doesn't make any sense. You know, the team is just, team will be distracted. They won't be able to achieve their goals. They will be all around the place. They won't be able to achieve what they are focused to achieve. The more focused they are, the more work, in, the less work in progress there is, and uh, the less WIP there is, the more focused they will be on that work, completing that work. Less they will be distracted on something new that keeps coming in or something uh, that's out of the scope or something that's, you know, that, that they committed to, but they can't complete because they don't have the capacity. So, First of all, you need to figure out why are they under pressure? If it's over committing, they need to work with the product owner, work with the technical team to come up with solutions to commit only what they can complete, what they can actually do. How do you find out what they can actually do? Look at the history. If you cannot look at the history, look at do one sprint, see how much they are completing. Use that number and go make it a baseline. Inspect and adapt. That is the principle of Scrum, right? Inspection and adaption. Okay, so that's how you'll answer this question. Now, the next question that comes up is, how would you say you would personally encourage fun at work or during Scrum events? Now, that's a very great question because as a Scrum master, it is kind of your responsibility to help team building, to do, do, do team building activities to help build a stronger team. Now, how would you say you would personally encourage fun at work? So, 
As a Scrum Master, what I do to encourage fun activities is that every Friday during our stand-up, we will have some games like, you know, like Kahoot. Kahoot is on Zoom right here. I'll show you guys. This is Kahoot, where you can do a quiz and you can, you know, the whole team can come together and they can answer on their screens and they, it's like a team building game right? Or you can do like icebreakers during the retrospectives or some fun games during the retrospective. Or if you are following one format of doing retrospective, for example, the 4L format, which is what did you like, what did you love, what didn't you like, what you lacked, all that kind of thing. You can change the format every other month to start a new method of doing the retrospective. And uh, that will give the team something new, something fun uh, to look towards and to work towards. And that will, uh, those are some things that you can do as a Scrum Master to create fun activities. Now, see, and the creativity is yours. You can do whatever you want with your team that you feel that will help them build better relationships with each other, that will help them become stronger together. So it's all in your hands what you decide to do, right? It's all in your hands. And what you decide to do, so, you know, be creative with it and find out ways that you can actually, you know, build a stronger team. Uh, that's how I would answer this question. Okay. Now, the next question is, walk me through how you have dealt with organizational dependencies. Okay. So, uh, I don't know what the interviewer is referring to by organizational dependencies. Is she uh, referring to, uh, what's she referring to, like, um, like dependencies on a third party organization or, or, or on a vendor or someone in the external company or was she referring to or dependencies within the company on different teams or different, um, you know, parts of the company itself. So I don't understand it, but let's dissect it. Okay. So organizational dependency, let's see if, uh, so we will answer it like, okay, if you have a dependency of some, on some team within the organization, how will you resolve it? Okay. So first of all, when you have a dependency on the other team, it has to be brought up during the refinement session, during the PI planning session. If it's being brought up during the PI planning session or during the refinement session, and the team is already aware of it before the work gets started in the sprint, right? It's already there. The team is aware of it that has a dependency. The team on which the dependency is, that team is also aware that this team has a dependency before the work even starts that will resolve all the conflict later on. Now there is complete transparency that there's a dependency on both sides, on this team and that team. Now it will be easier for you as a Scrum Master to communicate with the Scrum Master or the product owner in that team to resolve this organizational dependency. Okay, so that is how you will resolve organizational dependency. First, you will make it transparent bring it to light. How you will bring it to light is during the refinement session or during the PI planning session, you will sit down with the team and make sure that it gets reflected on your dependency board or the story that has a dependency. It has been attached to the story of the other team on which it has a dependency. And then you communicate with that scrum master from that team and make sure he or she is aware of that dependency. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so this is how you will resolve organizational dependency by being proactive, not by being reactive. And if you have to be reactive, let's say you jump into a situation where there is no PI planning happening, there is no proper refinement session happening. And you as a Scrum Master, you have to resolve this dependency. In that situation, what you will do is that instead of, instead of uh, you know, uh, jumping up and down and going to that scrum master all of a sudden, hey, hey, resolve my dependency, resolve my dependency. Please help me out, help me out here. You know, we have this. Relax. Now you have an organizational dependency. First approach would be going one-on-one -on -one to that scrum master of that team and explaining to them what the dependency is before you even attach it to their team. Some people, what they, some scrum master, what they like to do is they will, they will not communicate. They will uh, attach it in Jira. In Jira, there is a link. You can, you know, link the story to the other, other story. They will just link it there. And uh, it's rude. Okay, if someone does that, I am, I, when I was, I'm not a Scrum Master, I'm, I'm much higher now. But when I was a Scrum Master, if somebody would do that, that that's rude, okay? Don't do that. First, reach out to the Scrum Master of the other team, have a conversation with them, explain to them what the dependency is. And once you have explained to them what the dependency is, then link it in Jira to their user story that we have a dependency. Now, once you have linked it, there is transparency 
among the person who is going to be working on it, among the scrum master of the other team, among you and your team members, that this team, this thing has a dependency on that. Now you communicate with the scrum master. If they are being hesitant towards it, bring it in the scrum of scrum or the common meetings that you guys have and get it resolved that way. This is how you resolve organizational dependency, inter-team dependency, intra-team dependency, any dependency that you have, this is how you resolve it. Do you understand? It's very important. This is a very important question that they ask, okay? And if you have a dependency on a third party, then you need to get in touch with the person of point of contact, uh, the, whoever is the person assigned to you, uh, and then you know try to resolve it that way. But this is a very important question, and it's getting asked. These questions are getting asked more and more as the market is getting tough and jobs are becoming less and less. And the less qualified people, the people that are not giving good answers, the people that are not prepared for these interviews, they are getting kicked out. Nobody's hiring them anymore. The people that are actually qualified, actual experience, actual language terminologies, those are the people that are getting hired. And who are those people? The people that are getting trained under the real people like me who have actual experience in the industry, not by the scammers on YouTube. People like me who are training people, who are giving them the actual experience, putting them on actual projects and making them scrum masters and then putting them in the interview field. Those are the people that are getting hired. All the scammers on YouTube that are putting makeup and showing you videos and calling themselves this and that and are give, charging you thousands of dollars to teach you skills, they're scamming you and you're getting scammed. And I know this because I work in the industry. When you are in the industry, right? For example, if I go to London, my English will change. If I live there long enough, my English will change. I'll speak a language that will be very, very uh, kind of, you know, my, my, my dialect will change. My tones will change. My way of talking will change. Why? Because I just picked up the language that in the, from the land I'm living in. I'm living in London. So my language will change according to London. I'll get the English accent more. I'm living in America, so I have more American accent in my language. Same way, when you work in the tech industry for a very long time, you pick up the language. Be people in the tech industry, we talk to each other in the language and we, 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 we know when someone is from the tech world because the way we talk to each other is different from when we are talking to someone uh, who is a general contractor or who is just a YouTuber with a fake resume, fake experience, who doesn't know what she's talking about and she's scamming people, calling herself PhD, agile coach, whatever, charging people thousands of dollars. They are scammers. They are not real people, but you guys are getting scammed day in and day out. It is what it is. The market is getting tough now and only the strong will survive. It's that simple. And people who are actually in the industry, they know, they see that. But people who are not in the industry, you guys get fooled because someone looks like you, someone speaks like you, you guys get fooled and get scammed for your money, thousands of dollars every day. Be careful before you shout out your hard-earned money to anybody. I'm having a lot of people in my mentorship group who have been doing these programs for years with these people and they haven't still be able to get jobs. And as soon as they join my program, they're ready within two months, grab their jobs. And I don't showcase it. People are getting jobs from my group. Three girls got jobs. But I'm not showcasing it. I'm not telling anybody. Why? Because we are actually doing it. We are actually in the industry. We know what, what needs to happen to get someone a job. We are working with agencies, companies to place people. So real people are different. Don't give anybody your money before you do a verification check, before you verify the resources. All these people on YouTube, even me, if you're giving me your money, do your background checks. Ask people in my companies where I work or people that you know might know me or people that have got jobs through me. Ask them. Ask them about me. Do references check. Before you give anybody your hard-earned money, you need to check 20 times. Check their results. A lot of the YouTubers are scammers. Not, not all of them. But most of them, 99% of the YouTubers are scammers that are asking you for money. Only 1% is real. And the 1% that are real, and there are real ones, but they are not asking you for any money. Neither they are coaching, neither they are getting you jobs. They're just teaching you the skills. The people that are asking you for money, 99% of them are scammers. 99% of 1% of them is real. And that's the challenge for you to find those real ones. Join those real ones. You join those real ones, you're guaranteed to get a job. I'm not saying it's me. Do your research.
But people in my group have been getting jobs, even in this market. And if you are not prepared, this market, you're getting screened out. It's getting tougher and tougher. And it's not going to get any easier to go down the line. It's getting tougher and tougher. So you really have to be prepared. Okay. That's a small right now. Moving on to the next question. If the team continuously fails to meet their sprint goal, if the team continuously fail to meet their sprint goal, what will you do? Okay. So again, the same principle applies. First, you need to do a root cause analysis. Why are they failing? What, either they're committing their sprint goal too high, or either they're committing it, either they're committing unrealistic goal. Like for example, if the team can only build a car, but they're committing a goal to build an airplane, they cannot do that. They don't have the capacity or the skills to do that. So if the team is not able to meet their sprint goal, you need to figure out what's going on. Why are they not able to meet their sprint goal? What's the reason behind it? Okay, once you find out the reason behind the team not being able to meet their sprint goal, then you need to bring it to the team and let them make the decision. You are just a facilitator. You are not a decision maker. You are a facilitator. The team decides for themselves. Bring it in front of them. Let them make the decision what they want to do. For example, you bring the team is not able to meet their sprint goal. You do a root cause analysis. As a new scrum master, you ask the product owner and things like that. You find out that the team is overcommitting. Their velocity is 30. They're committing 60 every sprint. And that's why they are not able to meet their sprint goal. Of course. So in that situation, what you will do is that you will discuss, first of all, you will discuss this with the product owner. Why are we overcommitting? What's the reason behind it? Get an answer from them. Once you get an answer from them, then you bring it up in the retrospective in front of the team and let them decide what should we do here. Whatever they decide, whatever the conclusion you come up with, whatever you find out, you bring this in front of the, uh, the management and the stakeholders or whoever you are reporting to and let them make the final decision. You don't make decisions. You are a facilitator. You maintain transparency and bridge of communication between all these different parts of the, of the organization, the, the, the stakeholders, the team, the product owner, the technical people, you know, all these people, they're depending on you as a communication bridge to maintain that communication bridge between all these people. And you facilitate that and you make that happen. You find out the problems, you discuss those, you bring those problems up front but you don't make the decisions. Remember that. Okay, now moving on to the next question. What are the chances inside the sprint for team to continuously inspect and adapt? So the chances inside the team to continuously inspect and adapt are the scrum ceremonies. The scrum framework gives us these ceremonies so that we can continuously inspect and adapt. Daily stand-up, we meet every day, to go over what we did yesterday, what I'm working on today, what are we doing? We are inspecting and adapting. Maybe there is something better. Maybe there is a blocker that we are having we can remove today to get to move faster. This is inspection and adaptation to its core. A daily scrum ceremony is an inspection and adaptation to its core. Okay, retrospective. It's an inspection and adaptation to its core. That's how you do inspection and adaptation to the scrum ceremonies. They give you the power to do inspection and adaptation. Okay, so how do you do inspection and adaption? Through the daily stamp, through the sprint retrospective. Okay, that's how you do um, inspection and adaption. What is technical depth and how will you handle it? It's no technical depth, it's technical depth. I think, um, let's fix that. And uh, how will you, what are technical debt and how will you handle them? So first of all, what is technical debt? Okay, let's, let's answer that question first. Now, it's very similar to financial debt, okay? What technical debt is that? When I am building a software product, I mean the developer and the, whoever you want to be, I, I'm building a software develop product. You know, there are some things I might leave for later. I, right now, my focus is just to give a working, working iterative model to the customers that he, he or she can take it to the market and start generating investment returns, start generating money on the product that I'm building. That is the first goal of any business, right? So when I'm building that product, my goal is what I'm being told by my higher ups is that build a product, 
Don't worry about just build it, build it, build it. Give me an iteration so I can put it in the market and start making money. I need a return on my investment. Quicker, quicker, quicker. Right? We build that product, we give it to the customer. But there are some short things, there are some small things in the code here and there that we leave to fix later on. That is called technical debt. The so small things that we leave in the code while we are building this product and in a hurry to give the customer return on their investment, in the hurry we are giving it to the customer right away, but we are leaving those minor things to handle later on. That's called technical debt. How will you handle that technical debt, right? So first of all, you have to make sure that it is getting documented and logged somewhere in the backlog or in confidence or wherever, somewhere you are keeping a record of all the technical debt. Right? If you are a new Scrum Master, you have to find out where is technical debt uh, being logged or being stored. Second thing is that you have to make sure that part of the sprint, part of the capacity in one sprint is going towards a completing technical debt. That is how you will handle technical debt. Or if they ask you how have you handled it, part of our sprint, uh, 5 to 10% of the capacity in our sprint is reserved to our handling technical debt. And that is how I have handled technical debt in the past, okay? So that is how we will answer this question. And that is what is technical debt. It is very important. Always remember, it is very important to handle technical debt on time because if left, if left, this can cost millions of dollars in resources and the whole software program can collapse by just because of these minor issues, okay? So always remember, handling technical debt is super crucial and super important. And that is how you will handle it. Now, moving on to the next part. If bugs are built up in the previous sprints going forward, what will you do to prevent that from happening? If bugs are built up in the previous sprints going forward, what will you do to prevent that from happening? Um, if bugs are built up. So I don't understand the question. You know, uh, let's dissect this. So if bugs are built up in the previous sprints, okay, the bugs were built up in the previous sprints. So that means there were bugs in the code that they built in the previous sprints or there were bugs that they were working on in the previous sprint. What's the gist here? Going forward, what will you do to prevent that from happening? So let's, let's understand this way. Let's say um, there were bugs in the previous sprints that were built up and uh, they are getting carried over in the next sprint. They were not able to resolve the bugs in the previous sprint. Let's try to answer it that way, uh, because I think that's what the interviewer is asking, but uh, uh, let's see. So bugs were there in the previous sprint and going forward, what will you do to prevent that from happening from being the bugs built up and then getting rolled over? Okay, so there is a very important metric in Scrum called bug defect. Okay, it's the amount of bugs that you are made, amount of bugs that is coming in the code per certain, uh, like a sprint per certain MVP per certain feature per certain uh, amount of uh, amount of uh, work per certain epic per certain feature, right? Amount of bugs that are coming in that feature is called bug defect density. Now, that metric can be in Jira. It's you can create dashboards and you can use that metric. And if you join the mentorship program, I show you all these things in the program. Click on the link down below and join it right now. So now, if bugs are built up in the previous sprint, so let's say you're using that metric and there's a lot of bugs in the previous sprint that are being carried over, you were not able to work on them. So that's a problem of overcommitting. But see, what can be measured, can be controlled, can be handled, can be done. Right. So once you start measuring how much, how many bugs are coming in with the bug defect density metric, it will be easier for you to reduce that number over time in your code by bringing visibility and transparency of how many bugs are coming in in your uh, in your sprints, how many bugs are coming in in your sprints in the amount of work that you are doing. So let's say per feature per you per epic, you are getting about uh, seven bugs. Now it will be your responsibility to bring this in front of the team and explain to them, hey, we are having seven bugs. How can we reduce this number of bugs going forward? That is what you will do to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And you have to do that over and over and make it a very important metric alongside burn down chart and alongside a velocity chart. 
Okay, so that is the metric that you can use to make sure that the number of bugs reduce over time by bringing transparency to the amount of bugs that are coming in and measuring it and showing the measurements to people. Okay, now, and the other way that maybe the interviewer is asking this question is if bugs are built up in the previous prints going forward, what will you do to prevent that from happening? So there is a certain amount of capacity in every sprint that you have to leave for technical debt and for bugs. 5%, 10%, uh, 5% for that, 5% for that, right? There is a certain amount of capacity that you have to leave in every sprint to resolve the bugs. And the product owners don't like it because they just want to build, some of them, they just want to build, 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 and deliver value, 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 value. But you have to leave some space in the sprints for the bugs and for technical debt, okay? So remember that. So that is how uh, I have, uh, you can say that, uh, give a scenario, that is how I have handled this in the past. Okay, you can give this answer for this question. Okay, now, if you observe, the next question is, if you observe that work is not flowing on the board, what will you do? Work is not flowing on the board. These questions are a little weird. Uh, I don't know what the interviewer was thinking when asking the candidate these questions, but uh, it is what it is. If you observe that work is not flowing in the on the board, you, this is, this is what I'm trying to tell you. These are real questions. It should give you an idea that when you're going in an interview, don't have any expectations that they're going to ask you certain cookie cutter questions. Okay, they're going to ask you this simple, oh, explain to me, spirit of perspective. Oh, very nice. Ooh, ooh. They're not going to ask you these cookie cutter questions. Interviewer can ask questions from anywhere, from any, any topic whatsoever. To answer those questions, you need to have practical experience in this market. If you do not have practical experience, you will not get the job, okay? Or if you are not working with someone like me who is helping you with placements, who is teaching you the practical skills, you will not get the job. So the only way you can get a Scrum Master job in this market is through someone like me, a person like me, not through these other YouTube scammers. I'm the only person that can help you. So now moving on, work is not flowing on the board. What will you do? Okay, so I think what she's asking is that, you know, the work is uh, blocked, maybe? Maybe that's what she's saying. So, okay, if the work is blocked, then you need to find out why is it blocked? Uh, you need to figure that out. What is the blocker? Is it blocked because of, uh, uh, you know, some dependency? Is it blocked because of non-availability of resources? Is it blocked because of non-availability of uh, environment or infrastructure-related blockers? What's the blocker here? You need to figure out uh, what's the what's the blocker here? Why is the work not flowing on the bar board? What do you, what is blocking the work on the board? That's what you need to find out. So uh, the work is not flowing on the board, so it, it could be a blocker, and then you need to figure out what is the blocker there, and then you need to work on that blocker. Uh, if it's because that uh, maybe um, some some dependency is not getting resolved, maybe the infrastructure is not there, maybe some team member left, maybe. A lot of things can happen. You need to find out why is the work not flowing? What's the reason behind it? And then work on the resolution towards it. Facilitate the conversations towards the resolution. You don't dissolve anything. You facilitate the conversations as a scrum master. Okay? And let the team members come up with a decision and resolve things. Remember that. So you need to find out why is the work not uh, flowing, uh, uh, lady. Uh, um, and then, you know, uh, once you find out why the work not flowing, then you need to kind of like get into the solutioning part of it. So when she asked you this question, uh, uh, you know, you, you had to tell her that, hey, wh what's the reason the work is not flowing? I mean, wh what do you mean by the work is not flowing? Is it blocked? That's what you need to ask her. And then uh, whatever she says, uh, based on that response, then, you know, hey, I'll try to find out what the reason behind this is, come up with some ideas and then facilitate the discussion with the team and let the team come up with solutions. So that is how you can answer this question, um, uh, you know. Uh, but first you need to find out why is the work block. You need to find out that root cause. Okay. Now the next question is, tell me of a time you added value to your team. Tell me of a time you added value to your team. Yeah, sure. So as a Scrum Master, how I add value to my team is, see, the main goal of what is, what is, why, why do we hire, why do I, why am I, hire, why am I hire a Scrum Master as a business owner? Why? I hire a Scrum Master because I want to build a better product in the short amount of time. That is the value of a Scrum Master to me. Build a better product in the short amount of time, right? 
As a business owner, that's what I want. I want a maximum return on my investment. I am not hiring a scrum master to conduct. I'm not going to pay a scrum master $120,000 to conduct meetings and uh, you know do this simple task, administrative task. Here and there. I can pay a pro $20,000 more and make her do that. Why would I hire a scrum master for that? So you have to understand that there is a lot of responsibility on the shoulders of a scrum master. And that is why nobody will hire you without any experience. And that is why all the scammers on this YouTube channel that are scamming people, that are making fake titles of agile coaches and things like charging people 1,500 thousands of dollars to make them scrum masters. And the people that are working through their programs, they spend years and years and they still don't get jobs. That is why they're charging people so much money because the scrum master job cannot be had without any experience, without any knowledge, without any skill. It cannot be because it's a management level role. You have a lot of responsibility on your shoulders. And if you think that you can just watch a few YouTube videos and learn the interview practice questions and just crack the interviews and become a scrum master. You will be fired within three months. Who are you fooling? If you don't provide value to a business, why would, they, why would, someone, why would someone keep you there? It's all about providing value. If you cannot provide value, why I as a business owner will pay you $120,000, $130,000 a year to, bu to, to, to bullshit me? Why would I pay you money? You understand what I'm saying? The role of a scrum master is a very crucial role. And until you have experience, until you know what you are doing, you will cost the business a lot of money. In hiring, in firing, you will cost a business owner like me a lot of money. So all the scammers that are charging you thousands of dollars to make you scrum masters, they are a net negative on the economy and the country. So let me tell you something. How will you add value to your team? The only way a scrum master can add value to his team or her team is by delivering up, helping the team build a better product in the shorter amount of time. Okay, so now, how will you build a better product? How will you help your team build a better product in the short amount of time? By making sure that the team is clear on their goals by making sure that whatever work the team is working on, they're focused on it. There is no distraction. There is no scope creep. There is no, there is complete focus on the work in progress so that they can focus on that and they can do it better. Okay. Other ways you can do that is by measuring the team progress through velocity charts, through sprint burn down charts, through bug defect density, using these metrics, measuring what the team is doing and measuring and bringing it to light to the stakeholders, to the management team, all those people, and the technical team to show them how their progress is improving over time and what you have done over time. That is how you add value to your team. You help your team build a better product by helping them be focused, by showing them the clear sprint goal, by having clearly defined user stories so that they are not left guessing and they are not left shooting arrows in the dark. What are we building here? That is how you help your team build a better product in the shorter amount of time. So how will you help your team? Uh, tell me about a time you added value to your team. Okay. In the past, how I've added value to my team is that, uh, you know, first of all, I have started, I started with the team and there were two teams and one of the teams was going through a norming phase and the other team was going through kind of a storming phase. So there was a lot of conflict. When I joined as a scrum master, the first thing I did was introduce retrospective. So once we started having retrospective, we started figuring out what we were doing wrong, what we could do better. Once we started doing that process, uh, we also, I also started having making sure that people are attending the scrum ceremonies and are participating in the scrum ceremonies of the daily scrum call and the retrospective. When people were attending these ceremonies, I made sure that you know people are participating and once they're participating and they are they're sharing their opinions and you know there is more transparency and more collaboration, more team building exercises I promoted. I promoted pair programming exercises among the team members to build a more cross-functional team. And over time, we saw a less and less amount of conflict and we saw our velocity increase over time with the amount of work that we were doing increase over time, the amount of value that we were delivering to the customer increase over time. And that is how I have added value to my Scrum team. That is how you will answer this question, okay? Now, the next question is, give me an example of how you have successfully managed different stakeholders. Give me an example of how you have successfully managed different stakeholders. Um, so understand this, stakeholders, product owner is the representative of the business. Product owner is the person who will manage stakeholders. Scrum master's responsibility is not to manage stakeholders, but 
If the interviewer is asking her this question, then what the interviewer is trying to find out is whether she has experience working as a semi-product owner, or maybe she needs her to do semi-product owner work. Okay, you have to understand the intent behind the question. Now, the intent behind the question might be that she might want her to do some product owner work as well. Okay, so now, how have you successfully managed different stakeholders? First of all, you need to understand the contract behind between your company and the stakeholders, whether it's external stakeholder, whether if it's an internal stakeholder, okay, then that's fine. If it's external stakeholder, you have to understand the contract. In the contract, they will lay out the availability of the stakeholder. How, how can they be available? Can they be available every two weeks? Based on that, you will plan your releases because you have, when you're planning your releases, you have to do sprint demos and get the stakeholders approval to do a successful release. Right, so management of stakeholders depends. If it's an external stakeholder, depends on the contract. If it's an internal stakeholder, how you will manage different stakeholders internally is by making sure that the requirements that they are giving to the product owner, or if you are working as a product owner, the requirements that you are collecting from the stakeholders, you have to make sure that they are clear and they. Have, you have a stamp of approval. Once you start working on the requirement, you need to have a stamp of approval on those requirements from the stakeholders. Asking them, hey, this is what we are going to be working on. Do we have your stamp of approval? Yes. Then you start working on them. That process is done by the product owner back and forth with the stakeholders and the relationship management with the stakeholders. But if it's in your shoulders, then you make sure that you collect the requirements. Once you start working on the requirements, once you have broken them down into user stories and things like that, you need to go back to the stakeholders and get their stamp of approval on what you are working on, okay? Once there is that transparency and once there is that bridge of communication that you have their stamp of approval, then along the sprint, you can keep sharing your progress, your sprint planning. After your sprint planning session, you will share a report with them. After your, uh, you know, after your sprint, uh, whatever, daily stand-up, daily scrum calls, you will share something with them. Hey, this is what we discussed. This is what we're working on. Depending on your content, right? Maintaining that visibility is super important. Maintaining the transparency is super important when you are working, when you are, when you are dealing with, the, with these relationships. Just remember that. Okay, it's a two-way street, right? Maintaining the transparency is super critical. As for you as a scrum master. And then during the release, you take their feedback. You you know, if there is a back and forth and they say, hey, we didn't want this, show them what you discussed in the beginning and, you know, make sure that, you know, there is that flow of communication. There is that, uh, you know, there is that uh, communication part. And then uh, you get their approval on what you are delivering on the release and you release it to the product, product, to the product. Okay, once you release it, then you take their feedback and you put it in the next iteration or in the next break. That is how you handle stakeholder. That is how you handle stakeholder management. So now, if they ask you, how have you had successfully managed different stakeholders? This is how you will answer that question. Is that clear? Good. Now let's keep moving. How do you calculate velocity for old and new teams? For old teams. Okay, now one thing I want, uh, I want to address here. You know, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of preachers that are coming on my channel and commenting on my videos. Velocity is different than value. Value is different than velocity. What's the difference? What's the difference? You are delivering story points, right? That's how you are measuring velocity, right? How are you measuring value? More or less to story points, right? You stupid. Go and comment on someone else's video. And if you have so many comments, make your own goddamn YouTube channel. Don't come on my YouTube channel and give me this bull crap. How do you calculate velocity for all the new teams? So let's answer this question. And this was uh, the comment that I, I was saying about velocity and value. I was uh, mentioning it to some haters who come on my YouTube channel and they comment on my videos and they, you know, hey, you know, it's uh, people who hate, you know, but hey, what can you do about it? It is the world right now. So how do you calculate velocity for all the new teams? For old teams, it's very simple. What have they completed so far? In their previous sprints, you take an aggregate of that number in the past five sprints. If they have completed 40 story points each, then you 40 times five is 200 divided. So 40, 40 is the average number of story points. That is what their velocity is. Okay. For the old team, for the new team, you need to give them a few, a few sprints. You need to give them at least one or two sprints to be able to successfully calculate their velocity. You understand what I'm saying? They need to do one or two sprints before you can come up with a velocity, before you can 
come up with a number of story point number that they will commit in the next sprint and then come up with a velocity number over the course of the next three, four, five sprints. Okay, so how do you calculate velocity for old and new teams? For old teams, you already have, should have something from the history. With the new teams, give them some chance, let them do some sprints. And once they are doing some sprints, then you come up with the number and calculate the velocity. Now, the last question is, uh, with, infl with inflicting changes happening all the times and rapid changes, as you know, one of the value of Scrum is a response to changes. With inflicting changes happening up all the times and rapid changes, as you know, one of the value of Scrum is a response to changes. Yeah, flexibility, yes, okay. Um, as a Scrum master, how to prepare your squad members to respond to changes, requirements, and priorities without being stopped with that change? How do you prepare your squad members to respond to changes? Okay, so how do you teach them to be flexible? Requirements, okay, new requirements coming in. How do you teach them to the new requirements to the new changes and the new priorities without being stoked with that change? I don't know what the word stoked here means, but uh, okay, so I think the person here, the interviewer is asking the candidate that, uh, you know, flexibility is the name of the game. And as a Scrum Master, how do you prepare your team to respond to changes uh, and to respond to new requirements, new scope, to respond to changing priorities? Uh, without being stuck with that change, without, you know, I think burning out with that change. I think that's what the interview is referring to as far as I am aware. Um, so let's answer this question, right? So flexibility is the name of the game, right? You have to be flexible. You have to, you know, be able to respond to changes quickly, 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 quickly. That's why we have two week sprints. And that's why we have, you know, retrospectives where you can, uh, you know, figure out what you could do better and then move on to the next part, right? That's why you have the daily scrum calls and to kind of figure out, hey, if there is something blocking us or something needs to be changed, then we can change that and keep on, keep on, keep on, right? So if you are in a situation where there is a lot of changes coming in, a lot of requirements coming in, a lot of priorities are being changed on a daily basis, then maybe you need to have one week sprints, right? Because there is so much change going on that you need to change things constantly. Then maybe two week sprints are not for you. Maybe you need to have one week sprints, okay? And also, uh, if you are getting changes so much, what, what's the reason? What kind of business are you in? I mean, it depends on, you know, it depends on what kind of business you are in, what you're actually building. And uh, honestly, it depends on team to team and, you know, environment to environment. But I think if you can, um, if you can, you know, uh, maybe you need to do more refinement sessions during the sprint. Maybe you need to do three refinement sessions during the sprint to kind of, you know, change things around and change the priorities and change things. But the thing is that, or maybe you need to, you know, build very, very small user stories or very, very small tasks uh, so that, you know, uh, the team is uh, not changing constantly and working on a new task. You know, it only works on a small task, gets done, and move on the next one, next one. If something changes, they can easily move on to the next one without losing too much, uh, too much money and too much capacity. So I think that will be the better way to tackle that kind of problem. Make things smaller, sprint smaller, uh, do more refinement sessions, make that stories very, very small, maybe break them down into tasks and things like that. And if you are having constant changes, I would even recommend uh, not using Scrum at all. Maybe maybe use Kanban, uh, you know? Um, so if that kind of situation is happening with you, uh, you know, the backlog is constantly changing, 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 maybe use Kanban, uh, you know, I have a work in progress board and uh, things come in, they get done, they get moved out. Things come in, they get come in, there is no two week, I, there is no two week like time foundation um, that you have to do things within the two week and you cannot change scope from the two weeks. So I would use Kanban, there is no time foundation, scope can come in, scope can go out, whatever comes in gets done, then moves out and you keep moving like that. Um, I would recommend that if that is the situation that the interviewer uh, interview, the person who is interviewing the candidate, if that is the situation her team is going through, then I would recommend her, uh, you know, I would recommend my, in my candidate for my group to answer this in that way. That will showcase your knowledge. And that will also showcase, um, you know, that you are aware of all these frameworks like Scrum, like Kanban. So I would recommend you answer it that way. Um, first of all, you need to find out like what's the situation. Why is there so much uh, so much movement, right? What kind of business are they in? I mean, you know. And then uh, then we need to answer this like that. You know, if it's constantly coming in, let's maybe adopt, drop Scrum and adopt Kanban, and you know start working that way. So 
that is all for this video guys this is a this is a real question that i asked in the interview that were asked in the interview for the candidates hopefully you found value and hopefully you liked all the answers if you did click on the like and subscribe down below don't forget if you are looking for a scrum master job i'm the only person that can help you because not only will i help you mentor you coach you show you the skills put you on a project teach you actual job skills i'll help you with job placement as well none of these scammer youtubers who are charging you thousands of dollars and take taking your hard-earned money and you know you are there for six months seven months wasting your time and then in the end you are coming to me and asking me for discount don't do that don't fall into these traps okay don't fall into this do your background check do your reference check real people are different you can feel it in their faces you can feel it in their language these guys are scammers okay these guys are scammers they're hurting the economy. They're hurting people, hardworking people, taking their money, giving them false dreams. And, you know, they're hurting, they're hurting, hurting people. And sooner or later, things will catch up with them, whether it's with, whether it'll be the law enforcement or whether it'll be God. So don't get scammed. Do your background check. Do your reference check. Don't give your hard-earned money to anyone. Do your reference check properly. And once real people are different, you can feel it in their voice, in their personality. You can feel the reality. You can feel it. You know, it's different. You can't explain it. And just because someone looks like you, someone talks like you, doesn't mean they are they care for you. They might be only caring about their bank account, not your success. Remember that. So always do your reference checks. If you don't have a good gut feeling about someone, don't go with them. There's a lot of scammers out there. And 99% of people who are charging you money on YouTube to make you a scam master, they're scammers. They're scammers. Be careful out there, guys. Don't be a sheep. Thank you so much for watching. Like and subscribe. Um, give me a good comment down below if you like the video. If you didn't like the video, leave me a bad comment down below. I don't mind. Thank you so much for watching. If you are looking for mentorship, I'm the only person that can help you. Thank you so much for watching and have a good one. Bye-bye.